Uh, Lynn Kelly is, uh, I think, um, I'll refer again to Martin Bridstock's comment yesterday about scepticism not being a hobby, um, which I took on board uh, yesterday and mentioned last night at the dinner. Um, and I think a lot of the very active people in scepticism are people who are retired or semi-retired. It's very difficult to find time to really get stuck into some of these issues uh, when you're working full time. And I know there are some of us who are working who would like to devote more time to scepticism. Uh, Lynn Kelly is one of those people who actually um, does a multitude of things with a great deal of energy and earnestness and seems to be doing a number of things full time. She's an educator, she's a scientist, she's a novelist, she's an author, she's a, a committee member of Victorian Skeptics, she's a performer, she's a magician, she is a, pretends to be a psychic. Um, and uh, another thing that, that was mentioned, um, well alluded to yesterday, I think once again in Martin Bridgestock's talk and a couple of others, is the, degree, the, the amount of scepticism there is in the community as opposed to the amount of sort of non-scepticism or gullibility, but I think I think Lynn went to the World Skeptics Conference a couple of years ago, or was it last year? And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Lynn commented that she thinks Australia is one of the most sceptical countries there is. If we think we've got a battle, you should go to some other places like, well, I won't mention them, but uh, where and particularly issues about women's rights and stuff. Uh, people are facing a very big battle. So um, I won't talk any more about Lynn. I'll let her talk for herself. So it's my very great, great pleasure to introduce one of the Victorian Committee uh, members, Lynn Kelly, talking about scepticism in the classroom. Thank you very much. Have I found the on switch? Yes, I've found the on switch. Fantastic. Thank you very much. My issue is very much, if we're going to get this out into the community, the best way to start is in the classroom and teach them to think. As a sceptic in the classroom, I have got to remember one thing. Their parents may be believers and I'm in a contract with the parents to do the best jointly to the children. So we cannot undermine parents. So I can't sit there saying, anyone who believes this stuff's a total twit. Uh, apart from the complaints from the parents, it would be morally wrong. So this is how I go about scepticism in the classroom. I do believe that we should always have a warm and fuzzy atmosphere. So I'm going to start by lighting a candle. I want you all to feel relaxed, happy. I'm hoping we set off alarms and really have a bit of drama. And what I'm going to talk about is the way we can use the sceptical topics in the science curriculum, teach kids to think and then leave it to them to make the decisions because if we can give them the tools right, then we can do lots. Now, I'm going to go through some of the things that I do. I do performances around schools called Science of the Paranormal. I also teach and write for schools. So I'm going to have a look at some of the things that I do a subset because we haven't got a lot of time. I do like to start with a nice picture that ensures that I will get the attention of the audience. <laughs> and I do... And I start with a lighted candle as well, and there's a very good reason. This is spontaneous human combustion. It's something the kids have heard of. It really, really does happen that you end up with this sort of event where the body is completely and utterly consumed, much more so than a crematorium where you would get ashes left, crunch, 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 uh, nothing left, but the objects around it are not burnt, and you have a nice gory foot with a shoe still intact, which the kids, of course, love immensely. I've just got to find where my computer is. I'll give you another image just in case one wasn't enough. And what we've got to get across is the difference between science and pseudoscience. Up till 1998, we did not have an answer for this, an explanation that we could verify in the lab. Two possible approaches, the scientific approach, we don't know, we think there is an explanation, here's some hypotheses. The pseudoscience approach, it's spontaneous human combustion. And that's where science differs from pseudoscience, just watching the smoke here, uh, is that we are happy to say we don't know and that's why science is so sensational, because we're on an endless quest 
and kids all do science because it's the most fun you're ever going to have at school, except for English. So I must be respectful. Um, and so English is really good so you can express your science. So here's the explanation which can be replicated by every kid at home the ni that night when they go home and say, hey, you should have seen what we saw today. Take a candle, wrap it in a bit of gauze. A red one's good because then you get blood. And light it. I used a bit of um, cheap perfume because this is the skeptics. I'm doing really well here, aren't I? I use cheap perfume because oh, it's the skeptics. Okay, in... It's okay, I'll just yell. It's uh, because in one of the cases that I talk about in one of my books, The Skeptic's Guide, which, thank you for the copy. This is the American edition, which is now the one that's available if you order in bookshops here. Talk about a case where they examined it, which was a French case, and the murderers used Chanel number no. 5 to set the body alight. And the explanation is to do with the body seen as candle, which is candle wax, the clothes, like the uh, gauze around it, a small fire is started intense enough to start burning the body fat. It acts like the candle wax absorbed into the gauze, which uh, sustains the flame. And as you watch that flame, whenever you get bored with the talk, uh, you'll see that the gauze survives. Normally a bit of gauze like that would be gone. It's not. It will sustain that flame for ages. Clothes will sustain the flame long enough to burn everything and uh, to absorb the bone marrow as well, and the bits without the body fat are left. It's a small, intense flame, so it doesn't melt everything around, but it's not spontaneous. It takes about five hours. If the person's not dead or dead drunk, they're going to just put it out. So don't drink, kids. You've got to get morals into and ethics into anything you do with kids. So what I'm saying is every aspect of the science curriculum we can make more interesting I tell you, combustion's a dead bore to teach by using these as examples. Trotting across pits of coal is another one. Every class I've ever taken can see the pit of hot coals as long as you ask them a few times. They will soon all see it. Kids have sensational imaginations. I am sick to death. Let me get on my hobby horse. Sick to death. You can see the hobby horse just like the kids can see the pit of flames, can't you? <coughs> Teenage kids are sensationally wonderful. There are a few who are not, and therefore they make the news. There are 99% who have weirdo teenage things just like we did, but they're great. They can see a pit of burning coals. <coughs> they can see that when I walk across it, that foot is only in contact for a few seconds. I won't go through the full explanation I do with the kids. But basically, it's the difference between heat and temperature, a concept that is very difficult to get across in physics, partly because they've fallen asleep before you get to it. And as soon as you have them tritting, trotting across an imaginary pit of hot coals, a few of the class clowns acting up, which adds to the lesson, use the class clowns, that works really well. So we've now got physics and chemistry made more lively. The Australian skeptics, when the legal profession, Martin, you really have to do something about the legal profession, didn't stop us. Used to run pits. That was run in Ballarat in Steeble, no, 1986. 93. 93, 1993. I am a little annoyed about the organisers dealing with the media. They got this anonymous Steve Mon something guy. And there I am. And they didn't photograph me and put me in the... So I'm still a bit uptight about that. It doesn't hurt. And the fact I can tell the kids, I walked across that pit too, and this is what it felt like. Heat, energy, temperature, uh, thermal conductivity, lots of great topics that are in the Year 9 curriculum, and we can get them across really interestingly. Oh, I didn't edit out. You can't see that, can you? Good. Uh, the Dr Thomas McHale, whose name you can't see, sent this photo to the Cheltenham leader. And this is where I like to get across to the kids to be sceptical of what they're seeing in the paper. I can't say it's rubbish. 
but I can offer them an alternative. And I show them this uh, photo that uh, we were sent as the skeptics and that went out around Q skeptics and Victorian skeptics to help with about what is a real UFO. There you are. It was photographed in Melbourne last year, earlier this year. Ah, my body just died and splattered blood everywhere. Beautiful blood splats up here. And this photo was sent in and the Cheltenham leader asked me for a comment about it. I asked the students, what is it? And fairly quickly, some will start to say, oh, it could be a helicopter in the far distance. Some will, I will get out of them that it could be a bug very close up. It could be a bird in the middle distance. A questioning of a group will get that, which means I don't have to undermine the ones who in their head went, wow, there's a proof of a UFO. You cannot make kids look silly, let them feel silly in their heads, but never in front of their friends. So the next thing they all say is, zoom on it. So I do. And then I zoom on it again. And any of you birdos will go black swan with white under its thing. -o. So that's what we told the Cheltenham leader. It's a black swan with white, or that's highly likely. And the other comment I made was, if there was a UFO over suburban Melbourne, somebody would have noticed. What went into the paper? <laughs> OK, so getting the students to analyse this. When people read the newspaper, what do they read? Heading, Mr UFO sighting, in their heads, another one. And there comes the big argument. It's mentioned so often that there must be something in it. I'm quoted down there. The Australian sceptics, of course, get our little paragraph that no one gets to. Not first time here is added. Just to reinforce that this happens all the time. Response, so in case anybody misses it. And we can get free computerised spinal scans if we want to. Not flicking through the papers, we have now registered in every mind that there was another UFO sighting. The fact that it wasn't. So I say to the kids, OK, I agree that's a bird. But what if one night you really, truly, fair dinkum, saw a big triangular black thing passing over the sky absolutely silently. You watched it for 10 minutes. You really, truly did. What would you do? And uh, most of them say, go back to bed, I'm dreaming. I said, no, no, you're sure you're awake? You really do see it? Who would you tell? Would you tell your friends? No way. I would like to say to all the women here, the number one person they will tell is their mother. People trust mothers. Just thought you'd like to know that. And then I explained to the kids that this is rather sad because thousands upon thousands of people really, truly are seeing big triangular vessels, uh, planes going across. And why are they doing that? because prototypes of big triangular stuff has been tested since 1930. One thing we've got in the heads of the kids is that modern people can fly, but us old people from 20 years ago, they probably didn't even have planes, let alone great big triangular things. And they, in fact, were testing these balloons and all the rest of it from 1930. And where were they testing most of them? Out of area 51. And in we go, and there I have a photo from the American stuff. I won't go into the detail, but with the kids I do. With little people, that flew over and was tested. And yes, the government did cover up. Why did they cover up? We go into Roswell and the whole explanation of Roswell. Why did they cover up? Because there was a Cold War on. The disc was actually, you know, I won't go into the Roswell explanation. Anyone who does want it, please come and ask. We're going to the nature of materials because the comment that's made at the time is the material crushed. When you crushed it, it uncrushed and it didn't crush and we'd never seen a material like that before. You have. You wouldn't be shocked at all. But back in 1947, these materials were new. Polyethylene 
and this was in that case aluminium covered polyethylene. I've now got all sorts of different stuff about uh, military testing, but also commercial incompetence. Because out of Area 51, Boeing and Lockheed Martin also tested a lot of their jets and so on, stealth bombers, all a lot of it. People were actually seeing these things and then being told they don't exist. And the guys at Holloman Air Force Base actually listened to the radio whenever they released one because they couldn't afford a lot of tracking devices, so they listened for the UFO reports and used those as their tracking device. They had a vested interest in people believing they were UFO nutters. It covered up what they were doing and it tracked their balloons for them. So when one got crashed at, at Roswell, the Roswell people knew nothing about it. That wasn't a base that had anything to do with the secret testing at Holloman. Kids love that story. I can go into all the gory uh, or alien autopsies. But in the classroom, let's throw in some physics. Uh, this is water. There's a coin down there, bowl of water. That is a reflection of the coin in the surface of the water. Total internal reflection, all that beautiful stuff. You can do a lovely demonstration of driving along in your car. You see a bright light in the sky. It appears to follow you. It's got colored lights all around it. Um, when you get to a certain area, it just suddenly disappears and it doesn't show up on radar. And what is that? A total internal reflection off an inversion layer of the bright light off Lake Windaree. Now, what gets in the newspapers? I saw a UFO. I saw a total internal reflection of a bright light of the sunset reflecting off Lake Windaree. One's going to make it, one isn't. So getting the kids just to play around with a bit of water and a coin not only is a dream for getting across the importance of uh, the properties of light and all that wonderful stuff that we do in physics, but it also puts in their head, hang on, there are other explanations, and that can transfer. Hang on, there may be another explanation. I couldn't work that one out when she gave it to me as a puzzle. Maybe I couldn't work out the other one. So I'm trying to push scientific method into their head with fun examples. Crop circles. Lovely bit of biology and physics. I actually use this one to deal with the most boring topic I have ever taught in physics. I love physics. Please, physics people, don't shoot me. But there are some topics that are a bit dull at school that have to be covered. But the first thing the kids say, isn't it astounding that the crop circle is bent and it continues to grow? And I say, well, it would actually be more astounding if it didn't because you try bending dead stuff. It's the young green stuff that is by far the easiest to bend. You can use this in maths for gridding out because of the way they used to do them with uh, using a direction, distant direction and grid it out. The other reason I love this story is because there's a misconception among all teenagers that old people are stupid and lack a sense of humour. And except their own grandparents, they will always tell you they're different. And I talk about the two guys that started the crop circle craze, um, who were two old artists who'd retired over their beer in the pub, decided to have a bit of fun, and it was all a big joke. Then they say, well, why didn't they just admit it? And I mention criminal damage. So there's lots of biology, but there's also a fantastic bit of physics in this. Because one thing the kids tell me, once I've now got them seeing it's green stuff that's bent over, ah, but they measured magnetic field differences inside the crop circle. Explain that. And the explanation actually is beautiful because if you check back to the original reports, you'll find that the equipment they use, the seriologists will call in anyone who's got anything that measures magnetic fields. And the equipment they use, they are using off the base of the scale. And we teach calibration of, of instruments. Try teaching calibration of instruments to kids. They go to sleep. Tell them that 
if you don't know about this a measure off the bottom of the scale, you end up with crop circle measurements with you know, higher than average magnetic readings. That's where you can start seeing that calibration is incredibly important. Now, I'm not, I'm hoping I, I've got till half past, haven't I? Right, I'm going to start annoying members of the audience, those who haven't seen this sort of thing before, because this is really good to do with kids. Is this people down the front who have never handled these divining rods and never seen me use them before? If you, would you be willing to come up, give it a go? I'm going to, I need to find one sensitive. I need three or four. Because our chance of getting a sensitive out of one person is not many. But maybe, being women, of course, you're much more sensitive than men. Um, I, oh, sexist. I've been accused of being a male chauvinist, would you believe? I can't find more. I'll give you another one in a moment. Okay, what I've done, just to te test your sensitivity, is I've placed a magnet in the box here. And I want you to learn how to hold it lightly enough in order for it to feel, respond to the magnet. And if anyone can do that, then we'll start teaching how to do it with water. Okay? So what you need to do is, if you'd like to come back behind me, walk carefully and slowly towards it. Hold it as lightly as you can so they're free to move. And then when you get to the box, it's a very small magnet, you should feel a response to it. Yeah. If you'd like to keep coming, Raya, I would be really pleased. That's great. You really felt it, didn't you? Yeah. Terrific. I'm sorry, I don't need you lot, but you're welcome to come and try it afterwards. <laughs> Loretta, they're going to be suspicious. Ray, would you stay up here for a little bit? Because what is important is, uh, to get a sensitive first up, it felt very real, didn't it? Yes. If you'd like to look in the box, you'll find there's no magnet. There is a bit of paper in there that's very important that I need for later. Would you like to take the, bo the, magnet, uh, the bit of paper out? There's no magnet. That is called the idiomotor response. I want to try something else with you, man, with, uh, because Paul was talking about pendulums and the kids, yeah, if you just keep that for later. But I want you to try this as well. The idiomotor, I-D-E-O, motor response, also shows up with pendulums. And the kids are usually wearing things. This is my spider. Anyone who didn't notice I'm into spiders is missing something. Uh, if you hold a, pe a pendulum, if any of you have got necklets on that are heavy, and think circle, 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 I am not doing that. I have a strong idiomotor response. It will start going in circles. Can you try that? Just think circle, circle, circle. Don't move it yourself. And bigger circles. Think bigger circles than that. Think bigger again. Can you see it's, it's going much bigger? And it is definitely a circle. Can you yeah. feel that? Yeah. You're not doing it, are you? No. That's called the idiomotor response. Thank you, Maya. If you'd like to take that with you, I'll get that paper back from you a bit later. Uh, that is a fantastic thing to do with anyone because they can feel it because they know they're not doing it. And if you convince them, most people will get that idiomotor response. And what we're talking about here is delusion. Water diviners are not frauds. They believe it. There is a delusion. It goes like that. Every time they feel it, it feels real. Okay, let's go in the head of Maya, who happened to be in the country, a young woman, and she got some rods because somebody showed her, and she went, shoom, and when the rods went, shoom, they dug and water came up. Wow. And then, next time, she went, shoom, the water came up. People started making a bit of fuss of Maya, so every time she went, Pshung, the water would come up. A hundred percent of the time. How incredible is this? And how would Maya feel that she's now incredibly special? And along come the sceptics and say, oh, it's just the idiomotor response to myth. You're just an idiot falling for that. They're not. The truth is it's a delusion. It feels real. And now that person feels special. 
as time goes on, they start getting depths right and things. And that's starting to build up the experience of when it works and when it doesn't. What we've got to say to them is, yes, you've got an incredible ability to judge the land and the sensitivity, which Maya, I'm glad to say, has, but it's not actually the water. Unfortunately, the test is very easy. Check the evidence. There's the way we do it, but we can't do that. You know, get lines of pipes and everything in school. So what I say to the kids is it's a very simple test. It went showing there. Water came up. Dig over there where it didn't go showing. And you'll also hit water. And until that test's been done, and then you can go into all the geology of water tables and why you hit water everywhere and so on, you will not, until you dig where it didn't go showing and find there isn't water, you can't claim that the pshung was any way related to the water. That works very well once the kids have all done it. You show them that they're coat hangers, they can make them at home, and they take it home. And I always advise they divide the family dog. It works well for me. And kids will take that home and do it at home to show off their parents and trick them with the box with no magnet in it. And anything that makes the kids feel super smart uh, will go down well and stay in their memories. So these little demonstrations work really well. And she took her watch off so that when she looks at it, she hasn't got it. Uh, water divining. I'm not... These funny little tags here, reading the aura, that's when I then go into a magic routine with the kids and I do some mind reading and stuff at that stage, uh, but we don't have time. I did bring the equipment if anyone wants their mind read later. The other thing, we have to get out of the kids' minds that the people who are claiming these things are all frauds. And they think, we skeptics think they're all frauds. These guys are not. They're not frauds, they are deluded. This is the transcendental meditation people. And it's terrific again for physics because at the top of any bounce you get a stationary part. But also to get them to study the evidence carefully. And I at this stage would stop and say study it and tell me anything you can see that's a bit strange. I won't today, but within a minute or so somebody's going to say hey, this guy's blurred, why is he blurred when everything around him is in perfect clarity? And then they'll notice it's blurred in the vertical plane. Uh, I really admire these guys getting into the yoga position and bouncing up and down, I think it's incredible. That's the pay photo that appeared in the newspaper. When I purchased the photo, the whole mattress showed. That little thing really gets the kids. What we see in the newspaper may not be the whole picture. Now, this one is wonderful fun. Have you all seen this before? Good. Optical illusions. Can you see grey dots and black dots and all things going funny? Is there anyone in this room who can only who sees all of these as white dots? We've got one, two. Now we're going to court. Your Honour, were there black and grey dots there, or were they all white? How many of you saw the black and grey dots? And this silly, these two silly people down here tell us they're all white. Well, obviously they're wrong. We're right. And that really starts you worrying about eyewitness evidence. They are all white, we see it wrong. And I want to start getting in their head that perception is dubious. But um, optical illusions are things you do in maths classes, right? Nothing to do with the real world. So then I talk about the optical illusion of a straight road. Yep, go back. This is not my sort of machine. Uh, no, I, how do I go back? Oh, I use the one that says back. Right. <laughs> um, yes, I've gone back to dots. You can all see white dots if you squint your eyes. Squint your eyes, please. Thank you very much. Now, if you're ever witnessing anything 
for a, an accident or a murder, squint your eyes. <laughs> Martin, don't take evidence from anyone who hasn't. Optical illusions of roads. So I bring in the optical illusions of roads and say, well, you can see those two lines are exactly the same length. They don't look it because of the road. And then I sidetrack. I'm left out my sidetracks, but I go into a whole lot of other stuff because I want them to forget that. And I go, one of the best, I go through a whole lot of different optical illusions. How many people have seen this one? No, okay, we're going to muck about with it. She says, oh, well, if I don't finish, you can all come this afternoon. Uh, she says, uh, having to use a machine she doesn't know how to use, and if I mess up. Okay, on what side is the angry person? Left. Okay. Each time I stop, can you call out what side the angry person's on? It's left at the moment. Uh, she's got to find out how to do this. Ew, his mouse is sensitive. Ah, oh, well, that moved it. That was good. I'm trying to. <laughs> Thanks. Ah. Where is it now? I do this this way just so that you can see I'm not cheating because all kids all know PowerPoint. Left or right? Some lefts and some rights. How weird. Um, if you squint your eyes at it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, Your Honour, the person was very angry. Uh, our perception of the same picture, the same thing, can depend on distance. And I don't understand how that one works, but it works really well with the kids. With the kids, I get them up walking up and down. It always helps to get them up a bit walking up and down. And then I show them this from this year's news, end of last year, October last year, the big cat that we had down in Gippsland. I asked them how many remember the big cat Almost without exception, they all remember it. And I asked them to look at the article and we stopped for a bit. And what can they see? There's actually a whole stack of clues that it's a load of rubbish. One thing I do get a little irate about is why are DNA tests sent international? What's wrong with the Melbourne labs? Thousands of which can do this. Um, that's a clue. But I asked them to look at it and eventually somebody will say, Hey, that picture's an optical illusion. The optical illusions I was talking about before are actually being marketed in this case. That's a dead, the dead cat hung upside down. The head's been blown off, which of course the boys like and the girls all go, ah, oh, which is good. You want an emotional response. The guy right up in the background to get the image that way. And so we start talking about animals. We talk about the big cats crossing the road. You saw that illusion of the long road. The big cats tend to be seen in the country. You can get the illusion of them looking much bigger than they are because of optical illusions. The other thing I ask them is how many people know how a wallaby moves. And everyone knows that wallabies go boing a diddy, boing a diddy, boing a diddy, don't they? Not through the bush they don't. Wallabies, it, because they're not kangaroos. Kangaroos are in open fields. Wallabies are bush things that go boy that will run parallel tail out the back. And one farmer's told me that he gets big cat reports on his farm endlessly at exactly the place where his wallabies cross the road. Because for that short bit across the road, they don't get up and do they don't go run, 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 boing, boing, run. They just keep going. And so the first question when you get a big cat question is how do wallabies move? Not something that most people ask. Okay. I, as you know, I've written, some of you know, The Skeptic's Guide to the Paranormal. And that's geared straight at the skeptical audience. I've decided to start moving into other areas of writing because I think that the best thing we can do to get skeptical thinking into people's mind is convince them that reality is awesome. And so, my new book that isn't out yet, I'm amazed they've got it here, it's not due for publication for two weeks. Crocodile, subtitled Evolution's Greatest Survivor, you've got to get your little dig on the cover. Um, 
And that, that's, a, you've got to go, oh, aren't they cute? I mean, everybody goes, looks at the big aggressive ones that are going to eat people's babies. But this is a, that's a little baby freshwater. Uh, it's really useful because he's practicing how to sit in the water with his eyes and nose just peeping out like they do when they hang around ready to attack you. Um, so starting to talk about how awesome animals are, the crocodilian record is one of the strong... We have an expert here. I'm scared to say anything with Paul Willis on this. But the crocodilian fossil record is one of the most stunning there is. It was the record that convinced Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, that Huxley was completely and utterly right. It's a sensational evolutionary record. It's a sensational story. And no, modern crocodiles did not walk with dinosaurs. Their ancestors did. Ah, but we can see all the line from the ancestors through the evolutionary record. Uh, so I've managed to talk about how wonderful crocodiles are and get evolution thrown in without question. And so we go on to spiders, my obsession and next book, who are e equally, sorry, Paul, more exciting than crocodiles. There is 40,000 species of them to deal with. Wonderful, this is a wolf spider. Can you see the beautiful eyes? You know with ID, it's the eyes we can't explain with intelligent design. Spiders do even better. Crocs do the forward thing really well. Spiders will go backwards. This, this photo is deliberately got a side bit. That's a cave spider. They don't have any eyes anymore. They've gone the other way. Mark Harvey, the researcher in Western Australia, uh, that's their photo in their staff room. And this blind is always kept closed. And why is it kept closed? Because the receptionist there got scared of that picture all the time. <laughs> and they have to keep the blind closed. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do on spiders and arachnophobia, an irrational fear that I have had and now recovered from and overdone the cure. <laughs> uh, when it comes to media, we do have the new idea, one of our best scientific journals. <laughs> and I think it's important that the respect they showed at 9-11 by putting out this issue, I just want to mention it because I do feel very strongly that we put them down far too often when they did such a nice thing. They even put Nostradamus on the back which I thought was really lovely to make sure everyone knew that Nostradamus predicted 9-11. Uh, Not only did it, he did it 100 years after he died. The guy who faked that quatrain deliberately put a date that was outside Nostradamus' own life to indicate it was a fake. But we still got it, and I still get tons of people who tell me about that quatrain. I'm not going to have time to do all my tricks, but I will do, I think it's important that we demonstrate some things. And Nostradamus did premonition. He ain't the only one. I can premonise. Uh, yesterday, uh, Friday's paper, you all had it. City locked down for summit. Recognise it? Gentleman in the front, I can't see your name. Joe? Joe, I want you to tell me where I'm to cut the paper. There. Now, change your mind, please, because you insist. I want you to change your mind. No, if you insist. Eee. Would you like to collect that? Just in case we haven't had enough flame. I like using the flames up. Oh, isn't that pretty? Okay. Can you firstly confirm that every line is different? I, it really is newspaper. It is, yes. And can you read the line out that you cut at, the top line? Key finance ministers and central bank governors. Right. Maya, you've got a bit of paper up there. Can I have it, please? Joe, I'll get you to say that again. It's key. Key finance ministers and central bank governors. Right, it is key. Key finance ministers and central is the top line. Premonition is possible. I really am psychic. Thank you, Joe.
You may keep it. Okay. I would talk about lots. I'd bend spoons at that stage. I'd do all sorts of funny things for them. Talk about the five senses. And this is where it works really well with younger kids. Talking about the five senses and what is paranormal. Paranormal is when we're asking for a sixth sense, a sense beyond what we science understand. Astrology, I won't go into all the stuff. I am Australia's best known fake psychic. That's because fake psychics don't get well known. I do a lot of psychic readings. But what's important to the kids, you've got to make things relevant. What I do with these talks and schools, I do a psychic reading in advance. I've got my psychic stuff set up here. Toromancy, my um, psychic system, and I'll talk about it in a moment. I always make sure I've got permission, parental permission. It's older kids only, especially psychology classes. This is straight into the year 11 psychology curriculum and I do a reading in advance. I tell them I'm fake uh, but I'll talk about why that doesn't matter anyway. But for every kid we talk about astrology, talk about the procession of the equinoxes and all the rest and show them that in fact they're looking up the wrong one because none of them know what their zodiac sign is. To explain it's the the sign that the sun rose in at the time of your birth. And in fact, in the 2,000 years, <coughs> nice bit of astronomy, waffle, 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 they've changed, hey kids, the tall dark handsome stranger didn't turn up because you were looking up the wrong sign. <laughs> I then ask for anyone who is 30th of November, the 17th of December, um, <coughs> and I did this at a dinner for the neuropsychiatry department of Melbourne University. And everyone I talked to were neuropsychiatrists and psychiatrists, so I thought this is dead safe. And I said, has anyone in that area and one hand went up? And I said, my standard joke, isn't this really sad? Uh, you've got no personality. <laughs> <laughs> and then I usually add, maybe you're going to become an accountant. The joke has never gone over better than that night. They all packed up. <coughs> Guess which accountant had come to the dinner and was the one with his hand up. <laughs> that spooked me out. Kids love the fact that they're looking up the wrong star sign. That's another thing they like going home with. Tarot, the same sort of thing. When I use tarot and astrology, I, uh, people would say, well, you're a fake, but the system still works. So I, being a scientist, created a complete system called Toromancy. It has taken about five years now with its own textbook, handwritten because in Toromancy, uh, photocopying or replicating other than by hand takes away the spirituality. I'm sure you all realise that. <laughs> complete history of it. I need to do that to authenticate it. I have told them I'm a fake. I'm going to demonstrate the way it's done. I start on about Toromancy. They say to me, did you go to China and study this? I say, yes, they believe me. They then are believing Toromancy exists, even though I'm a fake, and off we go and they never work out where the fake bit starts. And at the end, I can debunk. And um, having a few who have experienced it, I make sure teachers select very carefully and who are willing then to say it and enjoy it, works a treat. If not, I will just play around with some if it's younger kids. Got to be very careful with this stuff because as a cold reader, I can be incredibly convincing even when I'm being stupid because cold reading works in the mind of the receiver. Uh, I won't go through the examples because we're running out of time. But I then talk about birds and ghosts. There's proof that I'm a ghost in case you thought I was alive. Do you like to prove these things? I am dead. And into sensing murder, and just point out one thing to them. They've all seen this show. I don't want to debunk the whole thing. It takes too long. I've got to get one key point into their heads. It was first filmed four years ago. Every show presented amazing new evidence to the police. Where's the outcome of the amazing new evidence? Not one. And the police is competent. <laughs> that... You've got a vested interest in that. Uh, 
That gets into their head. Hang on. I believe that. And that one point, and I'm always looking for the key point that they'll go home and talk about at home. John Edward is my favourite. And what I do is talk about evidence. This is a guy called Stephen Wiltshire. You can pick up his website. He's an autistic savant. And these are the images that he draws. That is Chicago. He went up in a helicopter, saw it, did not photograph, did not do anything else, came down and drew it, and that is accurate. Those buildings are where the buildings are. The floors are all correct. It is astounding. He is an autistic savant. He is retarded in all other ways, or whatever the politically correct term is these days. But we can test him. He's been tested and tested. He is happy to be tested because he's showing off. And it's great for his ego. It's great for our understanding of the human brain. And our understanding of the human brain has a has gone way ahead thanks to these guys. And there's another one called Kim Peake, who is an autistic savant, does all the mathematical stuff. He was the model for Rain Man. And so I say to the kids, what we need, we can test Kim Peake, he's tested all the time, but I tell them that he's just died. And in fact, I'm going to do what I'm challenging John Edward to do. I'm going to channel Kim Peake. I don't have time because I've run out today of time although I'm quite happy to if people want to miss their break. But I channel Kim Peake. He does his mathematical stuff. He even makes things fall over. This is called the magician's art. We have good fun channeling him, but the important thing that comes out of it is, John Edward, get one of your spooks to show the personality they had that was special about them before they died. And that's why I do the demonstration. And I ask them to uh, think about that. Every time somebody's talking to a dead person, why do they never permit a single question back? Because that's all it would take to test them. They, Kim Peake will be tested. Uh, John Edward won't. I then apologise to Kim Peake because I actually channel a guy that's still alive, which is a bit embarrassing. The disclaimer that appears, you've had long enough, you should have read it by now. <laughs> the disclaimer that appears on the screen for that long, and this is some, my gift to the English teacher. Any English teacher who accepted this from a student I would get extremely upset about. I give them 1.6 seconds like they have on TV, then I give them even longer to analyse it. That is one sentence. Produced for entertainment purposes only. This guy has people weeping and wailing in the raw stages of grieving and brings in the camera on them. That is exploitation. We skeptics claim the moral high ground. We would not do that. Then this incredible sentence says, waffle, 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 waffle. Fact, not intended to be factual statement in any way whatsoever. It is fiction. And that, I'm just asking them to be aware of disclaimers. I then give them option to ask questions on just about anything. So what I've tried to do is give them things that they will go home and talk about, ideas of investigating a scientific method. It's a hard sell for science in the schools. And the fact that reality is awesome, we don't need pseudoscience. Thank you very much.